Hello everyone, my name is Gabriel Christian. Welcome to my channel. On this channel, we try to pursue the education mission. And today I'll be talking with my daughter, Samora Dominique Christian, about a, a former Prime Minister of Dominica, Dame Mary Eugenia Charles, 1919-2004, who led Dominica. Uh, she was uh, head, of head of government from 1979 uh, rather, 1980, July 1980, when she won a general election to uh, 1995, when the Dominican Freedom Party was voted out of office and she retired from electoral politics and Dominica then was led for about five years by the United Workers Party. And so I'm going to hand over to uh, Samora because in 1996, I had occasion to interview Eugenia Charles at our home, this home, here in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. And this was the book that came out of it, Mamo, The Life and Times of Dame Mary Eugenia Charles. And at that time, when she was interviewed, our first child, Joan Christian, and myself had our baby girl, Samora. We named her after a freedom fighter from Mozambique, Samora Michel, and a middle name after Dominica, where we were born. Uh, Samora was born here in Maryland. My wife and I were born in Dominica. And this is a photograph of Mary Virginia Charles with Samora. And so Samora is now a graduate of the University of Maryland Eastern Shore in human ecology science. And she thought it important to ask her dad about his memories of Virginia Charles so that future generations can understand her quality, the qualities of her, her personal qualities, uh, what she did in leadership, and hopefully uh, those beneficial aspects of her uh, leadership style and what she sought to do for our country it can uh, be made manifest in future leaders. She was not a perfect person. She made mistakes. I'll talk about that. But I will talk about the glorious things that she did and the respect that she uh, was able to accrue, not only uh, among her political allies, but even those who opposed her. Uh, like myself, for instance, politically, we were Polish opposed it in many, many ways. But by the time she passed away, I consider her, considered her a friend. And that's how we got to interview, interview her and have her here at our home. After working with her for about 13 years, from 1983, through the Dominica Association of Washington, D.C., of which I was a member, later president, towards the end of her life. Samora, thank you for uh, doing this. Sure. Let's get started. Question number one. How was your philosophy of life shaped by the time you met Eugenia Charles? I was born in 1961. You know, by that time, the civil rights movement had started in the United States. And the civil rights movement in the United States was the greatest single sort of um, accelerant to the political consciousness of Afro-Americans of my time, people who are Africans in the Caribbean. And of course, the Caribbean is part of the Americas. So sometimes I'll use the term Afro-Caribbean or African-American. That was the time after World War II that the trade union movement parties in Jamaica, in Dominica, in Antigua, in Barbados, in Trinidad, in Guyana started to take office. And in Dominica, I was born on the same, the same month that the Dominican Labour Party led by a distinguished agriculturist, uh, Edward Oliver Leblanc from Vieques took office. He would be the prime minister who led Dominica for most of my life. And he was a great man, honest man, a nationalist a Pan-Africanist, someone who believed in his African heritage, his Kalinago or Carib heritage, who sought to elevate the working classes and prospered the country in way of agriculture, which was his forte, his competence, in culture, you know, you know, huge cultural shows at the Botanic Gardens, in um, publications like in, uh, Diaz Dominica and Aspects of Dominican History, and who opened the doors of higher education to thousands of Dominicans. But most importantly, Libla was a very modest leader, very thrifty, hardworking, a man of great integrity, and he consolidated in the public mind the Labour Party as a great institution. That's on Dominica. Of course, my parents were civil servants. My father, having been in the British Army, served as a police officer and a firefighter. Our mother worked with the blind as the instructor for the blind. But there were other persons who came to... Uh, shape my thought process. Um, one of the most uh, 
uh, you've got the book on the African Americans back there, Sam. You can maybe hand to me. One of the one of the persons, you know, there are several friends of mine in high school who were called Lincoln, you know, and I later learned more about Lincoln at the home of the former, the, the future chief of police, Owen Phillip. So Lincoln was a big person in in the Caribbean, uh, but but even more present was this man over here, Dr. Martin Luther King, who gave the famous speech, the famous speech in Washington in August 29th, 1963. The I have a dream speech. I remember when Dr. King was assassinated. I was on the island, I was seven years old, and I went to school, the Garozo Mixed Infant School, and they had us do a moment of silence. Um, so Lincoln was important. Uh, uh, another person later on in our teen years, we read about Malcolm X. Malcolm X was very important. His stance in defense of black rights and freedom was something that was very important. Uh, Malcolm X, lived around the same time as John F. Kennedy, our father. In fact, when I left home for Washington, in our drawing room was a tapestry of the American flag. At the center was the, was the uh, um, tapestry imprint of Martin Luther King to his left, Robert F. Kennedy to his right, John F. Kennedy. The three uh, persons all assassinated and many people, of course, on the island when I grew up associated the King, the Kennedy brothers and Dr. King with civil rights. Um, so, you know, the Black Panthers, you know, very important in their defiance against racism, standing up, shaped my generation. The Cuban Revolution had taken place and as, as, as is known, was helping African liberation. So Fidel Castro and Che Guevara were very important aspects of our, my early political maturation. In fact, when I first met Eugenia Charles, I would say that would have been in 1979, I had been to Cuba the year before as the president of the Federation of Students that was during the independence movement. We were still a colony and I had gone to Cuba on, the on a Cuban ferry called the Comandante Pinares because the Cuban revolution at that time was helping the Angolans fight South Africa, which had invaded that country. And many of us at sixth form would have been keen to go with the Cubans to fight for African freedom. But the earliest person in my household that shaped my view of life was Winston Churchill. Our dad had served in the British Army when Churchill was Prime Minister and his stirring oratory. We shall fight them on the beaches, we can fight them on the landing grounds, we shall never surrender. He would speak about that a lot because he said that was what inspired him on October 19th, 1943, to go up to Mont Bruce, British Army barracks overlooking look in Roseau and join the British Army, where he said it formed many of his ideas that he uh, sort of had as a guide for the rest of his life. Very disciplined man, very disciplined household with a lot of books. Eugenia Charles, I met her after the May 29th riot in 1979, when Rosie Douglas, who was one of the opposition figures, uh, in, the, in the riot erupted in Roseau on the morning of May 29th, because now then Prime Minister Patrick John, Dominic had become an independent republic in the British Commonwealth, we were not independent, tried to pass two laws to muzzle the press and another to cramp trade unionism. In those days, the trade unions were very prominent in the opposition to the Labour Party government. Although the Labour Party, irony of ironies, had evolved from the first trade union, the Dominica Trade Union in 1945. So the Dominica Trade Union was founded in 1945 and the Dominica Labour Party was founded in 1955, 10 years later, by Emmanuel Lou Black and Phyllis Shand Alfrey, okay? Emmanuel Lou Black had been one of the founders of the Dominica Trade Union. Uh, but the Dominica Labour Party under Patrick John had deviated from that sort of tie to trade unionism and had very little support among the trade unions. So the leading trade unions were at that time the Civil Service Association, that was a public sector workers led by Charles Savran, a Freedom Party, uh, opposition Freedom Party sympathizer, the Waterfront and Allied Workers Union led by Louis Benoit, a.k.a. also known as Zaboka. Zaboka is a patois of French Creole for, for avocado pear because he was very rotund, you know, he had a punch. And that was a very strong union. They represented the stevedores. In those days, there were people who ran the port and they were the folks who would load the ships and unload the ships. It's very powerful. And the Dominica Amalgamated Trade Work, the Dominica Amalgamated Trade Union, the Dominica Amalgamated Workers Union, Dawu. So Dawu was led by Anthony Joseph, Wawu, the Waterfront and Allied Workers Union, was led by Louis Benoit, and the CSA was led 
by uh, Charles Severin. There was a National Workers' Union led by a gentleman called Jemet, but it was very weak. It was very new and very weak. The Dominican Trade Union was still there, but it also at that time was very weak. And the trade unions were sympathetic to uh, the opposition. So uh, Patrick John wanted to uh, castrate, neuter, sort of uh, eradicate really the trade union leadership. And that law made it a crime to assist anyone who was on a strike. So if you were a father or mother and you gave your son some food or you gave him some help, you could be uh, held criminally liable. So as a member of the Federation of Students, as president, I was also head boy at the Sixth Form College, we gathered the students together and we joined with the trade unions under the ministerial building on May 29th, 1979, to try to block passage of that, those two bills into law. Uh, it would have been the case that they would have succeeded because of the fact that the Labour Party had the majority in Parliament. And when we did that, and we were impeding the proceedings, uh, the police were unable to stop the students, the young people and trade union workers and trade union members. The defense force was called in and they opened fire. A very good friend of mine, Philip Timothy, who I had uh, many, many days on the Rosa River, going up the Rosa River and coming down, was shot and killed. Uh, 10 other people were shot, some severely wounded, like Timothy Dover, who died recently during COVID, of COVID here in Washington. And uh, Eddie Gregoire, another friend of mine who was also shot and wounded. A baby died of tear gas inhalation. Uh, and after that, there was a popular insurrection and Patrick John was removed by way of parliamentary, uh, loss of parliamentary majority. His uh, members shifted to Oliver Serving as prime minister and he became the Impton Prime Minister. But during the negotiations, Rosie Douglas had proposed a committee to bring all Dominicans together, liberalites, freedomites, people from the political left, Dominican Liberation Movement, Popular Independence Committee, of which I was affiliated with the Popular Independence Committee led by Rosie Douglas. And Eugenia Charles represented the Freedom Party. At that time, she was opposition leader. She was an attorney. She would have been about 60. She was born in 1919, so she would have been 60 that year. She was born in May of 1919. And I remember at the St. Gerard's Hall, we were arguing about an outright revolution. There had been a revolution in Grenada under a British trained barrister, Maurice Bishop. And being politically on the left, a lot of us wanted to have an outright revolution that would have uh, sort of been an overthrow of our constitution. And Eugenia Charles was having none of it. She was a strong constitutionalist. She believed in rule of law and going by the book. And uh, her, her persuasive powers uh, and, and those who were her ideological allies in the Dominica Association of Industry and Commerce and the Church Council and the other unions, uh, at the end of the day, uh, agreed with her. And on, re on reflection, what she did was the right thing. Her view, as she later told me, was that we were a young country. We just uh, enacted our constitution. We just got no independence. And it would have been a, 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 an upheaval, uh, that would have been uh, lacking in any long-term beneficial value. That would have been very traumatic if you were to just simply have dismissed our constitution and the, due, the norms of due process of law that said the Labour Party had won the 1975 election. Her view was that the Labour Party should be allowed to complete its term in office. And so that's why the Prime Minister was Oliver Serafin, who had been elected under the Labour Party, and the government was made up of majority Labour Party ministers. And she was um, there at that meeting at St. Gerald's Hall. That's the first time I really met her. But I'd known of her and I'd seen her on platform speak. She was very, very eloquent. She was never married, never had any children. She was very stern, very manly, very robust, uh, no nonsense. But the first time we were up close, she had a white shirt, uh, you know, uh, uh, black leather heel shoes, a hand, black handbag and a very nice, you know, nicely pressed, pleated blue skirt and uh, attractive woman. And I remember she winked at me and she said, uh, boys, you know, take, take it easy, you know, take it easy. You know, we were very hot under the collar. We wanted a revolution. And she said, look, take it easy. And that is very important because the Committee of National Salvation allowed for different voices to contend, different Dominicans to contend, those from the left, those from the right, those from the Labour Party, those from the UW, not the UWP, that party was not founded yet, those from the Freedom Party. And so that was that, and the government went on. She became, at the end of its term in 1980, 
There was an election in July and she became Prime Minister after the Freedom Party won 17 seats, I believe. At that time, I'd now graduated from college and I was at the uh, Sixth Form College. And in 1981 and 82, I got the scholarship for law. And Eugenia Charles, his government, twice voted down the scholarship committee recommendation that I had given the scholarship to study law at uh, the University of West Indies, Cavill Barbados, in the last instance, I actually got a ticket from Leeward Islands Air Transport, Liat, to fly to Barbados. I had to return the ticket because uh, the word was that uh, Eugenia Charles and her party folks said, look, we're not going to bring Gabriel Christian back to work in the Attorney General's office. He's a radical. He's a communist. He's been to Cuba, you know, and uh, that type of thing. And uh, that scholarship was turned down. Interestingly, uh, I'm the last person alive, really, from the um, U.S. Nazi Party and Ku Klux Klan invasion plan to invade Dominica. In 1981, Algernon Mathie, a former Rastafarian leader in the hills, former friend of Rosie Douglas, now deceased, when he was in Montreal during the days of Rosie Douglas's Black Power leadership days after the Sir George Williams University uprising in 69 February, had been uh, contacted by Dominican Defense Force Captain Malcolm Reed. They'd been given a contract by Patrick John a contract signed with U.S. Ku Klux Klan and Nazi Party mercenaries to invade Dominica in 1981 to restore Patrick John to power. And we met at the home of Hilarion Deja in Portersville. And I was going to map it all myself, Michael Douglas, Rosie Douglas, and Hilarion Deja, whose home it was, about, about that plan. And I'll disclose here for the first time that Rosie Douglas' older brother, who had served in the Royal Air Force after World War II, Michael Douglas, slapped his forehead and said, my God, Patrick John has signed a contract to coup his own country. And it was our decision then to advise the government, although we were people in the political opposition of the government, we all felt that that was an awful idea. If we had this invasion, they would make of Dominica a white supremacy colony. So people from South Africa and Texas and the South would come to Dominica and have Dominica be a base for mercenaries and for Ku Klux Klan leadership. And um, Patrick John was arrested by the Eugenia Charles administration. But what is noteworthy and what future generations should know is that she never engaged in wholesale repression of labor rights. So they, it was targeted. Patrick John was arrested. Dennis Joseph was arrested. Uh, Malcolm Reed was arrested. He was as guilty as they come, and um, he was later convicted. And But there was freedom of speech. I was still an opposition member in support of the political left. I was still teaching at the grammar school as a civil servant. I never felt personally threatened. In fact, Eugenia Charles' government placed me on a commission inquiry to inquire into the affairs of the National Youth Council, which was at that time dominated by the political left from our years of um, activism and uh, mobilization of young people for the independence movement, Pierre Charles had become the president of the National Youth Council. And the Freedom Party government was very concerned because the National Youth Council is a government-linked organization. And they put me there to make sure that the commission had balance. It was just, it was uh, Judge Matthews, uh, who was the commissioner, and I was his assistant. Uh, so it's a two-person commission. And um, we, we found out there was no corruption, that the political left had won that uh, vote fair and square. So even while she was prime minister and facing a coup attempt, she never, she, in fact, two coup attempts. The first coup attempt was, was, was squelched by the joint efforts of the FBI and Federal Bureau of, Bureau of Investigation and the ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms uh, Department of the U.S. government in 81, April thereabouts, when they uh, seized the arms and seized the mercenaries who were leaving on the boat Manana from New Orleans for Dominica. And later that year, elements of the Defense Force led by Malcolm, not Malcolm Reed, uh, Frederick Newton, sought to overthrow the government in an attack on police headquarters on December 18th, 1981. Uh, at that time, of course, I, I knew of the first plot, I didn't know of the second plot. And uh, Frederick Newton was later hung for his complicity which, in that attack, which led to the death of policeman Alexander shooting of about 10 police officers, including Chief Philip, who lived in the street next to my house, Owen Philip, that is. And uh, Corporal Howell Piper was shot at the prisons by a uh, former cadet body of mine from the Dominica Grammar School, uh, 
Mr. Filbert and um, uh, Sergeant Major Benjamin was killed by police later on that uh, day after the coup failed. And so I, I have a part to play in the fact that Eugenia Charles remained as prime minister until she retired from office. Because had that coup taken place and succeeded, she would have been killed. Little at that time did I know how close I would end up being to Eugenia Charles. So in 1982, uh, having been denied a scholarship for the second time, my brother, Dr. Samuel, well, he wasn't a doctor then, but medical student, Howard, Howard University medical student, Sam Christian, made a way for me to come to Washington with the help of the uh, uh, small projects, uh, no, the, the Association of Caribbean Transformation, led by uh, Alan Williams, who later married my cousin, who had married my cousin, Mavis Christian, and I uh, came up to Washington, went to Southeastern University for one week, and what, the following week transferred to the University of the District of Columbia in 83. On October 19th, 1983, Maurice Bishop, who had made the Grenada Revolution, was shot and killed in a massacre at Fort Rupert, Grenada, after a falling out among the Grenadian revolutionaries. And Eugenia Charles came to Washington, met with President Ronald Reagan, and persuaded on behalf of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, the United States government, to intervene in Grenada and that was the 1983 invasion of Grenada by U.S. armed forces with their English-speaking Caribbean allies from the Eastern Caribbean, like St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Antigua, St. Kitts, and then with the help of the Jamaican Defense Force and the Barbados Defense Force. Eugenia Charles came to the YWCA headquarters at 9th and 8th Street to meet the Dominican community. I remember people like uh, Charles Minad was there, I believe, and uh, Joey Van de Poel, who was then living in Washington, and the association folks and the Secret Service and I was the PRO of the Dominica Association of Washington DC and from 1983 whenever Eugenia Charles would come to Washington we would host her we would uh, represent Dominica at the Cherry Blossom Parade on, on, on Pennsylvania Avenue would raise funds for the public library send books to the public library in fact in 1985 1989 I'm sorry we sent we sent uh, 10,000 books to Dominica library system, the biggest project we ever did up to that time. So there were people like David Winston, who was our treasurer, Simpson Gregoire, who was our president, Gregory Lewis, Winnie Lewis, Elo uh, uh, Fitzroy Bertrand, his wife, Anelia, uh, Billy uh, Robinson, uh, Eddie Gregoire, a lot of folk, and Miss Charles would meet with us and she would talk to us and we'd work for Dominica. And, and I know, Sam, you've got a few more questions, but I just wanted to say that Eugenia Charles, therefore, you know, was someone who was not a political ally, I was not part of a party, but I was observing her in way of her integrity. I was observing her in way of her adherence to rule of law in the case of the 1979 change of government and her attitude in governance when she was under military threat when there was actually physical efforts to liquidate, liquidate her, that is to take her life, overthrow her government, there was never that kind of repression and whole scale oppression of the Dominican people. Those who were arrested were targeted based on the best evidence. They were given their day in court. Some were acquitted and some were convicted. And of course, one person was executed after having his rights of appeal all the way, I believe, to the, to the British Privy Council. That would have been Frederick Newton. It was a very difficult time, uh, but, but it was a time that allowed me to observe and reflect on how in other countries they just wrong the people up, put them in jail, as happened in Grenada during the revolution. Bishop was a British trained attorney, but he abandoned the rule of law. He abandoned the constitution. He never held an election. You know, they would arrest people in Grenada and just say, you're a CIA agent or you're an enemy of the state, up the hill for you. You know, so when he fell out with his comrades in the New Jewel movement, uh, which uh, constituted the majority, in fact, of the People's Revolutionary Government. There was no parliament for him to appeal to. There was no lawyer to get him uh, for, filed uh, on his behalf a writ of habeas corpus to bring his body to the court, see why he's been held. They tied him up in his home in St. George's, Grenada, and young students and others, young people and so on, workers had to go bust him out, and they took him to the fort. And the People's Revolutionary Army attacked the fort, there, there, uh, there's evidence that people may have had weapons and may have shot at them, but in any event, it was a massacre. 
to Soviet BTR armored cars through rockets and heavy machine gun fire into that place. And about 17 Grenadians were massacred, which triggered the invasion of Grenada on October 25th. And so here we had a change of government in Grenada where the constitution was set aside. Rule of law was eradicated for that period. People were just arrested on the, on the slimmest evidence that they were anti-government. You know, free press was, was really not even a concept. You know, free press was suppressed. Freedom of association suppressed. The civil liberties of the Grenadian people suppressed. At that time, you know, many of us of my generation supported Maurice Bishop because to us he was a Pan-Africanist, a liberation hero, a revolutionary. I mean, we're young. You know, I was 19 when I went to Grenada in 1980 as a guest of Maurice Bishop. I still have my invitation. Comrade Maurice Bishop invites Gabriel Christian to the first anniversary of the revolution. But I was a young man. I had not gone to Georgetown University Law Center. I was not a lawyer. I had a lot of uh, political dogma in my head. Uh, a lot of the things I believed then about the freedom struggle of black people, I still believe. Human rights, I still believe. But what I learned when I compared what happened in Grenada to what happened in Dominica, where we tried to stay within our constitution, and we mostly did in that the members of the Labour Party voted against Patrick John and for O.J. Serafin. There was no coup d'etat. There was an election in 1980. People had the opportunity to go vote freely for the persons they desired. There was no showing that the Freedom Party imported Dominicans by plane to vote for them or that they gave monies to anyone to vote for them. The, the CIA, according to Bob Woodward, did support Eugenia Charles and did give $100,000 pennies. When this Labour government right now in Dominica, of course, is spending millions to import Dominicans, giving people money to vote for them, refusing electoral reform. It's a good time to remember leaders like Edward Olive Lily Blah, uh, Ibn O.J. Serafin, certainly Eugenia Charles, in her adherence to rule of law. Sam, I know you may have another question or two for me. Tell us about Eugenia Charles and her development work. Eugenia Charles, while she came from the political right and was a conservative friend of Ronald Reagan, George Bush I, Margaret Thatcher, and so on, she ran a social democracy because she did not destroy the gains for the working classes and the rural populations of the labor, that the Labour Party had put in place, like access to education. She made that even more available. Uh, access to uh, small loans for farmers, she made that even more available. Eugenia Charles' family was maybe the wealthiest black family of the day. Her father was a millionaire. He, John Baptist, J.B. Charles, was the first black person in the Eastern Caribbean. We know her, maybe in the Caribbean, to own his own bank. Started in 1940, the cooperative bank, called the Penny Bank, which meant you could open an account with a penny. Because he wanted, he was a, John Baptist Charles was an amazing person. He was an associate of Booker T. Washington as, in way of correspondence. They corresponded. And when he went to uh, the U.S. to meet Booker T., he had passed away. But he met, he met George Washington Carver, the famous African-American scientist, who did a lot of the peanut at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. And he sent his uh, uh, two sons, I think Lawrence and, and Rennie, to Tuskegee, then to Morehouse, and then to Edinburgh, where they both were the only two persons of color in the medical sciences faculty, or medical sciences student body. And they, uh, so, so Eugenia Charles had an older sister, Jane, uh, and two brothers, so the two girls, two boys. Jane became a nun and died in England of consumption or tuberculosis, I believe it was. And her two brothers became physicians and she became the lawyer and never got married and was the right hand of her father and mother and ran, ran the family business as her parents get, get, got older. But her father was a strong agriculturist, a strong industrialist. He had a lime oil factory, he had sugar, he had uh, some sugar, sugar plantations, he had citrus plantations. He, owned an insurance agency. He brought Chrysler to Dominica and had a six Chrysler cars being rented out in Roseau in the 1930s. And so he took on a tour of Europe during the time Hitler was coming to power, you know, and so they were well to do. And um, uh, she was then very uh, businesslike and encouraged private enterprise, encouraged farmers to own land. And she did not really become an oligarch or use her office to grow wealthy. Eugenia Charles was a very charitable woman and she gave her lots of scholarships quietly, you know. She didn't want people to know to, for kids that were less, uh, what you call, uh, financially able to afford 
high school education. She did the Education Trust Fund. She did adult literacy. She made outreach to the diaspora. And in 1988, had the first Dominica reunion, encouraging Dominicans from all over the world who had left for better opportunities to return home. This government has been here for 20 years. They've never done anything similar. In fact, they've misused the diaspora by bribing people in different countries like the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom, and the adjoining islands, French islands like Guadeloupe and Martinique, Virgin Islands and Martin, to fly home in breach of the electoral laws to vote for the Dominican Labour Party. Eugenia Charles didn't do those things. And so while she was not an ideological ally, I became very close to her. And I'll tell you one, I'll tell Dominicans and, and the world a particular instance that really resonated with me. Couple of times she would stay at, you know, maybe the Mayflower or some of those more auspicious hotels, but several times she stayed at the home of Angela Benjamin. Angela, ben Angela Benjamin was a German who grew up under Adolf Hitler, actually met, Hat met Adolf Hitler. And Angela Benjamin's father had been in anti Nazi resistance and was involved in Operation uh, Valkyrie with Colonel von Stauffenberg. So that is a very interesting lady. And she married a Dominican PhD student at the University of. California, Los Angeles, UCLA, Dr. McDonald Benjamin, who later became a World Bank executive. Had two children by him, McDonald Benjamin Jr., who uh, also became a World Bank executive, went to Georgetown University in Oxford, and Sandra, or Alexandra Benjamin, who became an actress in Hollywood. And she would stay at that apartment owned by the Benjamins, which they also used as our embassy because she was thrifty. She did not want to waste the state's money. She would stay there. And I remember going to see her once with uh, Simpson Gregoire, who was then president of the association or vice president, and I was president, or one or the other. And she's sitting on the edge of a bed and she's telling us what we should do to help Dominica. And Miss Benjamin is right there, Eugenia Charles is right there, and we're right there in the bedroom on two chairs. And she's talking to us like you talk to a friend. By that time, she'd been in office for about 10 years. So we'd known each other and we'd done different projects. And um, I actually brought her to Georgetown University in 1992-93, uh, when she was prime minister for a conference of Dominicans here in Washington. There's a photograph of that in my memoir aboard the Commandante Pinares, which is named after the Cuban ferry I uh, took to Cuba in 78. And um, very unassuming, nobody there. She'd have maybe one or two Secret Service people with her, but most times, you know, just Miss Benjamin and one Secret Service agent no big fanfare, no big, you know, she's not arrogant. You know, she was very warm, talk, told us lots of jokes and uh, very down to earth. You know, she very wasn't pompous. You know, she wasn't wearing fancy clothes and fancy jewelry and all about fancy cars and mansions on a hill. Here was a lady who was modest, who uh, uh, displayed the highest integrity in office and someone who I believe as, 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 as Dominicans, as a people of African descent, uh, as leaders of any kind, black, white, Jew, Gentile, Asian, Hispanic, uh, it was really exemplary. I mean, she burnished her image. I was at Georgetown University taking a class and the professor was Republican National Party Chairman Frank Farenkoff. And when he discovered from some person, I was from Dominica, he said, you from Dominica? What a great island, what a beautiful island, what a great leadership. Tell Yuji hello for me. He called her Yuji, meaning Eugenia Charles. So Dominica wasn't perfect. There were things that she would have done, she, like with the Cuban graduates who were discriminated against because it was the time of the Cold War, who didn't get jobs, uh, the failure to diversify the economy. Uh, although she did warn of that and did work with Taiwan to bring in new plant varieties to diversify our agriculture output. Uh, but she, by and large, ran a government where you could have your own views and still hold a job. You could have your own views and not be arrested on bogus charges. So Sam, you know, that I know I may have cut over, but any further questions maybe on Eugenia Charles? All right. Um, my next question for you is, what does Eugenia Charles have to do with the sale of Dominica citizenship? Okay, this is something we've never agreed with. Those of us on the political left, the progressives, and I consider myself of that tradition. Irvin Andre and I, Judge Andre, we've written about this thing, and we've thought that it was a bad idea. But what Eugenia Charles tried to do, to some credit, was that when China was taking over Hong Kong in the early 90s, 
she thought that the Chinese, the Hong Kong Chinese, who didn't want to leave under a one-party state government, might be somehow encouraged to invest in Dominica, and as a result of that investment, they would get a, a pass uh, Dominica citizenship, and so they could be then able to travel to different parts of the Commonwealth in ways that ordinary Chinese would not be able to do. So it had some merit. You know, it was an interesting way to generate foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment that would benefit the ordinary Dominican. It was not as successful because I only know of one project that didn't come through, the Shangri-La Hotel, which today is just a, junk, a hunk of concrete in the Dominican jungle in the Laie Valley. Uh, but the idea was good. But there was no scandal ever that with this idea of citizenship by investment, ministers of the Dominican Freedom Party grew wealthy. There was no controversy or any outcry that they had developed in Dominica a passport peddling oligarchy associated with people like Enji Lap Seng, who was a Chinese mafia boss arrested by the FBI and imprisoned for money laundering, who when he was discovered, when he was arrested during the bond hearing, he was a Dominican diplomat. There was no scandal as with Alice Maduke, the most disgraced Nigerian minister of oil, who supposedly stole $20 billion or 20 million Naira. And when she was arrested by Scotland Yard in London, it was discovered again, she's a Dominican diplomat. Dominicans didn't know any of those things. Or one of the most infamous, heinous crimes against our reputation. When the Iranian spy, sanctions buster and money launderer, Ali Rizam Monfared, was arrested by Interpol in the Dominican Republic after hiding in Dominica with the assistance of the scared government, he was again found to be a Dominican diplomat. How? And this is by a Labour Party which came from a rich legacy which has now been ripped to shreds by its misconduct in office. Eugenia Charles never had any of those controversies launched against her as having, you know, uh, given diplomatic passports to people who ended up in the hands of the law as mobsters, as money launderers, as uh, mafiosi. And so while she initiated that program as a means to acquire foreign exchange for our country's development, uh, and that it did not do much that I know of to speak of, uh, that was the genesis of the program. It started with her, uh, it did not have that sort of disreputable and horrible reputation that it now has because of the misdeeds of the current regime on Dominica. But it did start with her. And I wanted Dominican students of history and others to know how it began. It began after China uh, assumed uh, the control over Hong Kong. And it was an effort by her government to secure foreign direct investment for the island. Okay, next point. What is Eugenia Charles' legacy? What is Eugenia Charles' legacy? Honesty in office. She was an honest woman. Um, I mean, there's a certain degree of political bias. Again, it was a Cold War. Those of us who are on the political left and were associated with, you know, left-wing ideas at the time of the Cold War, you know, like here in the United States, you had people like Paul Robeson and a lot of movie stars were blacklisted. Right here in the United States. The land, the, the land of the brave and the home of the free, you know, where you're supposed to have freedom of association. You had people having uh, to lose their jobs because they were politically left. And so um, it was not unusual. So I don't take, you know, I, I, I don't take it personally. I, I've been able, I was able to go to Georgetown University and I never forgot my country. I kept on working. I never reproached her. And Miss Charles, I want to share with the listening audience, fell sick was at Sibley Hospital here in Washington, and she called me. That's how close we were. I remember walking across the street with her in Washington, holding her by the elbow, guiding her across the street. She was teaching then at the John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. As a matter of fact, when she uh, was with you, Samora, and that picture in the book, she was a professor at SAIS, that's the School of Advanced International Studies of John Hopkins University, quite an auspicious institute. and. Um, uh, I never reproached her. I never said, you remember me? She knew who I was. But, you know, God is good. And, he, you know, he made a way for me. And I, again, you know, I, there's one thing I learned is never to hold grudges. 
She did what she did, but God had his plans. And the legacy she has for us that we ought to exalt is honesty in office. If you're in government, you're in government to do the people's business, not to build a house and say that it's only 400000 when it's a $4 million house, or to use uh, monies uh, gotten through your leadership position in government to build mansions on the hill, or to use your position to sell the badge of citizenship of your country, which is your passport, to people who are crooks and criminals in a way which destroys the reputation. You know, many of us in the diaspora, all our lives, have been dedicated to the proposition that Dominica is a great nation, that Dominicans are honest and decent people, hardworking. That's what our profile has been, and now we have all kinds of people who are really not Dominicans. They were not born Dominicans, they never knew Dominica, they don't necessarily love Dominica, but they paid for their citizenship. And some of them are involved in nefarious activities and being arrested. And who gets the blame? Or who will get the blame? Dominicans will. And we are irresponsible people where we allow for that to continue. We have to stamp it out. We have to eradicate the rot that has destroyed the noble legacy of our small island nation, which was burnished by people like Edward Oliver Lee Blanc and Eugenia Charles, Edison James, what those people did. No one ever said that they were thieves. Even Patrick John, he made terrible mistakes, but nobody ever said that he was a thief, that he stole from the public till, that he converted public funds to his personal interest, that he used his position to get wealthy while his nation and his people got poorer and poorer. And so the legacy in Caribbean history, in Dominican history, in world history, was that the persons or the people who I've met who knew Eugenia Charles, black, white, whatever way I go, they always have a very high opinion of her. She was well-spoken. She was intellectually agile. She was well-read. She carried with herself with a degree of gravitas and dignity. And she uh, used her office to do the best she could. Did she do the best she could have done? No. I believe there are several places where she fell short. But I was honored to have been able to associate with her in the development process. And I had the ability to observe her close up and direct and found her to be a person of charity of spirit, generosity of spirit and grace. Someone who was kind and where she may have been a little, uh, little robust in the way she treated some people. I mean, she was very, uh, she didn't like nonsense and you know, she gave short shrift to fools and knaves. But I, I, I think that she left us a good legacy in way of honesty in office and that she did not abuse her office for personal gain. That's, that's her legacy. And it's a legacy that all leaders or those who hope to be leaders can learn from. When you get into office, you're there to do the people's business. Never abuse your time in office for personal gain. And in that context, in that moment, in this moment, I must salute the legacy of Eugenia Charles.